Good morning, grandkids. Uh, we are reading some more of the listener today. I'm reading my chapter 28, I think it is. The kid and I walked through the door and at last we had found Cicero. He was on the stone floor in a pool of blood and was looking quite dead. Two skeletons were hanging attached to the wall on either side of him. Near him he had managed to make a fire in a cauldron besides which he had finally collapsed. I walked up to him and hunkered down by his side and reached out and touched him to see if he had a pulse. He opened his eyes and looked surprised that I was still alive, that I had made it past all his guardians and traps. His voice was weaker than it was when he had been calling out to me. You caught me, he whispered. I surrender. I didn't reply as I examined him to see how badly he was hurt. It didn't look good and there really was nothing I could do. He spoke again. Killing me would be a mistake, you know. Our mother would be very upset with you, listener. I still didn't say anything. I looked around for the kid and saw him staring at those skeletons with a shocked look on his face. I turned back to Cicero as he drew on what energy he had left and said, do what you will with me. Cicero has no fight left. He took a few breaths and went on. You could go back to Astrid and lie. Tell her that you killed me. A little bitty lie. But walk away and leave me alive, sort of. I was through looking over his injuries and said, Yes, Astrid sent me to kill you, but I have had no intention of doing so. I came to find you so that we could talk. We must do something about Astrid, and I will need your help. I've already assured the Night Mother that I'm not going to kill you. We've got to get as many of the others as possible on our side. I can't do this alone, Cicero. You've got to get better. Here, drink this. I brought you several of the most powerful healing potions that I could get my hands on. I will leave the rest here beside you. Keep drinking them. I've got to get back to the sanctuary and assure Astrid that you are dead. I grabbed the kid by his arm. Let's get going. Outside I saw with surprise that Shadowmere had returned after delivering Arnjorn back to Astrid. He was standing for me, his red eyes looking directly into mine as I walked out. It was kind of creepy how he seemed to know right where I'd be at any given moment and always looking me straight in the eyes. We flew back to the guild and of course the first thing Astrid asked me when I walked in was if Cicero was dead. I lied easily and assured her that he was. She was so happy that she told me I could keep Shadowmere longer. Now we have to get on with our present task to assassinate the Emperor, she said. Go see Festus. He will tell you what we have planned and what you are to do next. I found Festus just getting up from his bed. Evidently, Commander Garrow has brought a famous chef called the Gourmet to Skyrim to prepare his special dinner for the Emperor when he arrives, Festus was explaining. We don't know who this Gourmet is or what his name is because his identity has always been kept secret. I have acquired a copy of his cookbook, Uncommon Taste. It was signed to someone named Anton Verain, so he evidently knows the Gourmet. Anton is in Markarth's keep. You are to go there, learn who the gourmet is and where he is, then kill Anton. 
Next, you must locate this gourmet and kill him. Be sure to hide his body and search it. You must take his writ of passage in order to get into where the dinner reception is being held. Once there, you will put on the chef's hat, find the kitchen, and tell the cook that you are the gourmet and that you are to prepare your special recipe, but they may assist you. You will have a special ingredient to add to the pot, which will poison the emperor. He sighed and grumbled as he said, you got all that? Then turned and walked away. Well, great. Once again, difficult orders with no details on how to carry them out. This assignment involved a lot of details with a lot of potential for me to get caught. After what I had just been through, I was not eager to turn right around and take on such a dangerous job as this one was going to be. Since the date of this dinner party was a couple of days away, I decided to wait a bit before tackling this fiasco. I went to find Nazir to see if he might have something easier for me to do. Besides, I missed him. I found him in the main hall by the pool near the waterfall. I walked over to him. By the nines, woman, you're a mess. I take it that Cicero's blood is what's on you, not yours, I hope. I know, I sighed, I'm bloody, dirty, tired, and hungry. Please, let me help, he said, and the next thing I knew, I was in the pool. When I surfaced, spluttering, I looked at Nazir. He was standing there with his hands on his hips, laughing. I never heard him laugh like that, and it sounded good. With his eyes twinkling, he said, well, I've done my part. Now get cleaned up and meet me in the dining hall, and I'll feed you. Then we'll get you put to bed. He turned and walked away, chuckling. Others were standing around, either with grins or astonishment on their faces. Babette thought it was such great fun that she jumped in with me. I washed off the best I could, with Babette even helping to get some blood smears off my armor. I finally got out and went to a single bedroom I had been using and got out of my armor. I found a casual dress and put it on, brushing my fingers through my hair and trying to, trying, tying, I'm so sorry guys, and tying it back at the neck with a ribbon. Was this really me? Sometimes I just didn't know anymore. When I arrived at the dining hall, I smelled hot food and my stomach rumbled. As I was coming down the stairs, I saw Nazir in the kitchen area, dishing up a plate of food. I was astonished to see that he had changed into more casual clothes also. He turned toward me when he heard me on the stairs and almost dropped the plate. We stood there just looking at each other. Finally, he got himself together and turned back to the dishing up of the food. Sit, sit, he said, which I did. He brought over the two plates and placed one in front of me and sat down with his and started eating. He looked over at me and said, eat. Thank you for doing this for me, I said, as I smiled at him. Well, don't get used to it. You're the only one I'd fix food for. Or shove into a pool, he said with a chuckle. Actually, I appreciated that, and Bet thought it was great fun. Then he turned more serious. Eat up. After this, I'm putting you to bed. Oh, joy. No, wait. What? I knew I was reading more into what he said than he meant. The problem was, why did it affect me the way it did? Who am I? 
Am I still the uncared-for kitten tossed over the side of a wagon? Or does someone really care? I've never known what that feels like, but I think it might feel like this. I shook my head to clear it and decided to be sensible. I turned to Nazir and said, I've, I've got a contract involving two people to kill and poisoning the emperor at a dinner party. It involves a lot, and if I miss one step along the way, I could be dead. I'm pretty nervous about this one, and I'm reluctant to even start it. He looked at me with concern in his eyes. I know about the contract, and I've been worrying over it. I wish I could have my blade at your side. I can't see how you could have anyone with you, though. And get away with it. Believe me, I've been thinking about this, but there's just no way. I appreciate just knowing that you'd be with me if you could. Hey, I appreciate you feeding me, too. Maybe you could pretend to be the gourmet. Ha uh, ha, no way. I cook for no one. Well, except you. Then he looked at me seriously again and said, Are you through? When I indicated that I was, he said, Then let's go get you in bed. And got up. Have you picked out a room of your own in this maze? Yes, I use a small room with one bed and a table and chairs, which I need for my riding. As we walked along, he asked about what I write. I told him about my journal and that I tried to find time to write in it most nights and had been for most of my life. By now, I had saved several journals stashed away, but that I always keep that but that I always keep that first journal with me and watch everyone I'm and watch everyone that I'm writing about in it at the moment. I explained to him it helps me clear my head mainly, but when I die, someone might be curious or care and pick it up and read it. Then he looked at me very seriously and said, I will read it, I will care. He leaned toward me and barely brushed his lips across my forehead. I know I gave a little gasp and felt like a fool. We were in front of my door and he said, get in bed and get some sleep. You're going to need a clear head and lots of energy. Before he turned away, I stopped him, getting serious about my contracts. I really don't plan on starting this gourmet contract right away. I really don't feel up to it. This would be a good time to get some contracts done for you if you have anything. Well, I do, he said, if that's really what you want. I have three, but you can certainly do them do them whenever. Come find me when you're rested and we'll talk about them. And he turned and left me there. I went on into my room a little disappointed, but not really knowing what I was disappointed about. Before I went to bed, I sat down at the table and got out my journal. I have a lot to write down to get caught up. I'm also sitting here thinking about Nazir, the strange unknown feelings that I'm dealing with and about life and death. So that's the end of this chapter, grandkids. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll be back next time with another chapter that we can enjoy together. Bye-bye, grandkids.